Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's talk in our Evolution and Ecology seminar series. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Stephen Stearns. Steve obtained his PhD from the University of British Columbia. Uh, he was later a professor of zoology at the University of Basel in Switzerland. And during that period, he co-founded uh, ESEB, the, Evolution, uh, the European Society for Evolutionary Biology, of whose journal JEB, Steve was the founder and first editor-in-chief. Steve then moved to Yale University around 20 years ago, where he is the Edward P. Bass Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. Steve is also co-founder of the International Society for Evolution, Medicine and Public Health. He has greatly contributed to the development of life history theory and has written several books on evolutionary principles and on evolutionary medicine. Today, Steve will talk about the evolution of aging, the great transition and the increasing risk of chronic disease. As usual, there will be a Q&A session with Steve directly after his talk. Uh, please post your questions in the designated Slack channel and give your thumbs up for questions you would like to hear answered. Steve, very much, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Um, over to you. Looking right okay, well, I, I, hello everybody. I'd, I'd like to start with my acknowledgements. The work that I'm going to talk about today synthesizes results and ideas that have been developed over the last uh, 30 to 40 years. And uh, you can see here on the acknowledgement slide that there have been an awful lot of people who have helped, and I'm grateful to all of them, but I'm not going to step through all of that. I've been told I should be fairly brisk, so we have time for questions. I'd like to talk today about how the evolution of aging has interacted with the profound ecological changes that have gone on in the human environment over the last couple of centuries, and how that helps to explain the global crisis in chronic disease, which has started to develop around the world as a result of aging. So my plan is first to talk about why, why is it that we age uh, and give you some theory and evidence on that. Then I wanna define the great transition which has affected mortality, fertility, nutrition, and hygiene. And then I would like to mention a few of the genes that are involved in antagonistic pleiotropy that are changing the risk of non-infectious diseases. At the end, I'd like to consider the question of could we evolve to live longer? And I think we might a bit. Steve Austad thinks we might make it to 150 in the next few centuries. Uh, but I think there are going to be some costs of which we should be aware. Okay, so the events that frame our lives, and by that I mean the big life history traits, birth, childhood, adolescence, maturation, adulthood, aging, they have all been intimately shaped by evolution. Not just, they are not evolution is not the sole cause of them, but they, it is certainly a shaper of the background structure. So from birth through to death, uh, evolution has written on our genomes and on our physiology. And T.S. Eliot expressed it very succinctly, birth, copulation, and death. That's all the facts when we come to brass tacks, birth and copulation and death. Now I'd like to define a term. Uh, when I say the great transition, I actually mean the combined effects of three transitions. One of them is the industrial revolution. The second is the demographic transition. And the third is the epidemiological transition. And I'm going to step through what each of these means in a bit more detail. It's doing at least three big things. It's shifting age distributions from populations dominated by the young to populations dominated by the old. It's changing selection pressures. Uh, it's reducing mortality rates in infants and juveniles. That results in selection for earlier ages at first birth. Uh, this is actually medicine and public health acting to change selection pressures on humans. And as it does so, it's uncovering in the aging population previously hidden costs of genes that improve reproduction. Those costs are contributing to the global burden of chronic disease. And if we go in and try to mitigate them with gene therapy, with CRISPR-Cas or any other method, there is a significant danger of having some unpleasant surprises. It all depends on when one does it, when one intervenes, and, and how one does it. But I would like to emphasize that there are big black boxes here that we don't know about. 
So for those of you that aren't familiar with the evolutionary theory of aging, I'm going to step through it. And for those of you who are familiar with it, um, I'm giving kind of a cartoon of the classical version of this. And you can certainly bring up points and questions if you like. I know that uh, the, the version that I'm giving is largely true, but it has been modified in some ways. So the power of selection decreases with age basically for two reasons. There are fewer old organisms for selection to act on because some have already died. And older organisms produce the next generation more slowly than do younger ones. So if you look at the time it takes for a genetic change to have an effect, it will have it faster if it acts in younger organisms than if it does in older. So that's one idea. The second idea is that because selection on the old is weaker than selection on the young, genes that improve reproduction early in life but have this side effect of reducing survival later in life will, up to a point, be selected and will accumulate in the genome. We owe the first idea to Peter Menoir and the second idea to George Williams. The importance of their contributions, uh, both to this and to other issues in biology, has been abundantly recognized. Now, Tom Kirkwood took those ideas and he developed the disposable soma theory as a way to connect them to physiological, biochemical, and genetic mechanisms. If you accept what Medawar and Williams said, then organisms should invest less in maintenance than it would be needed for an indefinite life. And if you look at this cartoon of Tom's ideas, where we see that the level of repair that optimizes fitness is lower, it's to the left of the amount of repair that would be needed for indefinite survival, you basically see a picture of why it is that we are not immortal or don't are not potentially immortal. I'll come back to that question later in the talk. Now, if we look at selection on lifespan, uh, and this is basically from life history theory, if adult mortality rates increase, then organisms should evolve more rapid aging. We can reduce that to a simple statement. Why should you invest in maintaining a body that's going to be dead anyway for some other reason? It would be better to concentrate on reproducing while you can. So the life history theory of lifespan is that reproduction early in life contributes more to fitness than reproduction late in life. There are trade-offs between reproduction and survival and those cause an optimal level of investment in reproduction to evolve at that level of investment, which we saw on Tom Kirkwood's slide. Intrinsic mortality is non-zero because maintenance is not perfect, and that determines potential lifespan. And by intrinsic, I mean inside the organism, mortality that's caused by lack of maintenance rather than extrinsic predators, pathogens, weather, things like that. So of course, it's always a question, can we trust the theory? So I'm now going to go through a bit of the evidence that shows that the evolutionary theory of aging is actually pretty well supported. The trade-off between reproduction and survival is real and it has genetic causes. It's been demonstrated repeatedly in both lab and field. So I'm going to show some of that evidence. Next, I'm going to summarize 14 artificial selection experiments in flies. Then after that, I'll give you an example of experimental evolution of lifespan in flies. Then I'll show you some evidence for aging in bacteria. So here is a very dense slide. Uh, it summarizes these 14 different artificial selection studies. On the left-hand side, you can see some blue boxes for traits and the traits are labeled. Things like early and late fecundity, developmental time, longevity, and so forth. On the right, you see uh, some pinkish boxes that uh, have other physiological traits in them. Let's concentrate first on the left-hand slide. Anytime you see an arrow leading from one box to another, it means that the box that contains a trait where the arrow originates is the trait that was selected on. 
and the tray and the arrow is pointing to a trait that was measured as a correlated response. This means that for a period, for example, let's just take the trait that leads from early fecundity to late fecundity. What you can see is that if you increase early fecundity, you either get no response or you get a decrease in late fecundity. That's what that zero slash minus means. It also means that some experimenters spent at least 10 and probably more like 30 to 50 fly generations selecting on early fecundity. And then at the end of the experiment, they measured late fecundity, see what had happened to that. Overall, this uh, picture you're looking at reflects more than 50 person years of, of research. And the image that I want you to take away is that the traits are connected by trade-offs. The trade-offs can be measured as correlated responses to selection. If you select to increase developmental time, then body size will go up and late fecundity will go down and early fecundity will go up. If you select to increase early fecundity, lifespan, longevity will decrease. If you select for a longer life, early fecundity will decrease and so forth. So the take home message is that organisms are bundles of traits that are connected by trade-offs. Now, we addressed one of the ideas in the evolutionary theory of aging with an experiment that we called the ham-lamb experiment. Ham was for high adult mortality, lamb was for low adult mortality. The experiment had lasted seven years. So basically we took three replicates of populations of flies and we subjected those three replicates to high adult mortality. And then we had another three replicates that we su subjected to low adult mortality. And we did this consistently. And then we did assays uh, with flies taken out of the selection regime and assayed next to the selection regime to see whether or not they were responding. So when we did this mortality assay, uh, we could ask, did lifespan evolve? We did it on 60,000 flies. That was 5,000 flies per line and per sex. At that point, there'd been about 90 high adult mortality generations and about 50 low adult mortality generations. The generation differed because the high, high adult mortality was so strong that a fly had about one day to live after it closed on average. A few lived into the second and third day, but not very many. The low adult mortality was as low as we could make the mortality in the lab. In other words, we kept the flies going in a very, uh, supportive environment, and they lived on average about six weeks. So the generation time of the high adult mortality flies was about a little over two weeks, and that of the low adult mortality flies was about six weeks. We measured the age-specific mortality rates at three-day intervals. And by the way, when we did that, we replaced any dead fly with a white-eyed fly so that we kept the population density of the flies that we were assaying constant. This is the main result here. You can see on the x-axis, the age of the flies. You can see on the y-axis, the age-specific mortality, which was measured every three days. The open boxes are for the high adult mortality flies and the closed boxes are for the low adult mortality flies. Below the x-axis, you can see the number that were dying in the particular intervals between uh, eclosion and 40 days, between 40 and about 58 days, and so forth. And above that, you can see the uh, significance levels for the differences. So basically, you can see that the mortality rates did change, and that was intrinsic mortality. And they changed between day 40 and about day 80. So they evolved as predicted. George Williams predicted that in 1957. What difference did it make to lifespan? Well, the high adult mortality flies after the selection had occurred were living about 60 days and they also had earlier maturity and higher fecundity, which is what is expected with life history theory. The low adult mortality flies lived about 65 days that had later maturity and lower fecundity. So all of that makes a pretty consistent image with the sort of age specific version of life history theory. Since a day of, in the life of a fly is about a year in the life of a human, 
it, this would mean that uh, this would be a five year change in human lifespan. Now that would be a major breakthrough. That would be, uh, you know, if any drug company could get their hands on something that would change human lifespan by five years, they would be all over it immediately. Evolution did it with strong selection in about 100 generations. Now, must all organisms age? That's the question of could we be immortal? Well, at least uh, two Silicon Valley billionaires would like to know that, and they're both investing in it. And that leads us to the question of which organisms must age. And this is an interesting question, and there are some interesting exceptions. There are a few things like Hydra and perhaps some other organisms that appear not to age very much. And if you want to ask me questions about that, please do, because I think that they are exceptions that prove the rule. So here are some answers to which organisms must age. August Weismann, in a lecture in German in 1882 to the Deutsche Zoologische Gesellschaft, uh, basically said asymmetrically reprodu reproducing organisms must age. So he distinguished asymmetrical from symmetrical. That was forgotten. In his very influential 1957 paper, George Williams thought that it would be sexual organisms that had a separation of soma and germline that would age. The soma would be mortal and the germline would be immortal. Linda Partridge and Nick Barton uh, wrote a paper in Nature in 1993 in which they stated that any asymmetrically reproducing organism in which a mother can be distinguished from a daughter must age. And we'll go into that in a minute about why. I think they're right. And I think Weismann, uh, who had been forgotten, uh, foreshadowed their insight. Our experiments uh, that Martin Ackerman did for his PhD thesis uh, essentially show that they were right. And other experiments that were done on E. coli uh, suggest that all cellular division is probably asymmetrical. And so thus, in some sense, all organisms must probably age. That makes the apparent exceptions even more interesting because it points to uh, the kind of process that you might want to look at to discover why. Okay, so symmetrically reproducing organisms should not age. And the idea here is that if division is perfectly symmetrical, you, can, uh, you can't distinguish and selection can't distinguish between the mother and the daughter cell. Both are equally intact or equally damaged and the reproductive payoff from improving the performance of each is equal. And so the maintenance in both descendant lines should be equal. However, if the organism is asymmetrical and you can distinguish a mother from a daughter, then the, that species should age. So here's Colobacter. Colobacter is a bacterium. It does not have a germline and it's asexual. So According to George Williams, this should be potentially an organism that doesn't age, but we can see that in fact, the Partridge-Barton criterion is probably correct because it does age. And the idea here, if you look at the life cycle of uh, Colobacter, is that it actually looks a bit like our life cycle. It is a bacterium that has a stalk. It sits down on a surface and then it grows. And when it divides, it produces something like a larva that swims off and set, sets down and then starts to repeat the cycle. There is an inner birth interval. It takes a certain amount of time between each division of the bacterium. And each time it divides, it releases what looks like a larva, but it's a bacterium. Now, when the payoff of maintenance becomes smaller in the mother cell than in the daughter, so that happens when the mother has started to reproduce and the daughter cell has not yet started, aging is going to start to evolve as a cost of reproduction. Here's some data. And Martin uh, got this in Ursianol's lab in the Biocentrum, and he did it by being able to follow individual bacteria and see when they divided, and he could age them because he was following them individually. And he had a good video system with a microscope so he could see when they divided. And on the x-axis, you see the age of the cells. And on the y-axis, you see their reproductive output. And you can see a very significant decline in reproductive output with age. So these bacteria are aging. Now, 
Francois Tardier and his group, uh, and the lead author on this paper was Stuart, uh, in Paris picked up this idea. And they decided to see if they could apply it to a bacterium that does not look asymmetrical, at least to the naked eye, E. coli. E. coli looks pretty symmetrical, but if you label the components of E. coli, you can distinguish uh, the different parts of the cell. They have an old pole and a new pole. So you can see here that uh, you have a cell that gets the new pole and a cell that gets the old pole, and you can just follow that down through generations. So for example, you could have cells that were descended new, 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 and cells that were said descended old, 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 and everything else in between. And on the left-hand side, you can see the or showing uh, the lineages, showing an old pole effect on growth rate. And if you then look at consecutive old new pole divisions and look at the ones that just got the new poles on the upper part of that right-hand uh, frame and the ones that just got old poles, you can see that over the course of seven divisions, which is not very long, the normalized growth rates of those lineages are diverging very strongly. And the competition uh, that the new cells are posing for the old cells is essentially crowding out and eliminating the old cells. So that's straightforward natural selection, which is in, in essence uh, rejuvenating the genome by uh, having this process generate old ones and uh, new ones and having the new ones outcompete the old ones. I think there's a very deep implication of this. Our germline, that is the continuity of our reproductive tissue, is continuous back to the origin of life about 3.8 billion years. And that's probably as close to immortality as any of us can possibly talk about. That's what is potentially immortal. In other words, life itself is potentially immortal, but not any individual organism. So in that sense, uh, George William was, Williams was, had, had a good insight. He saw that the germline was potentially immortal and the organisms, the soma, that were the vehicles that were propagating the genes uh, were going to be aging. Now, the germline has divided asymmetrically in every generation since the beginning. And in each of those generations, the new was preserved and the old was discarded or outcompeted. Not immediately, but over a few generations. And that is what has kept the germline in good shape. I used to think before I saw these experiments that perhaps the germline had unusually superb biochemical maintenance. But I think that that was never necessary because natural selection was providing the maintenance automatically. And therefore, selection for the maintenance was never that strong because natural selection had already taken care of the problem. So let me sum up on the evolution of aging and then make a transition. The evolutionary theory of aging is well supported in most, if not in all animals. Where it's supported, aging is a byproduct of selection for success in reproduction. It's not directly selected for itself. We have evolved to be good at reproducing for billions of years, but how well did that prepare us for the great transition? Well, not so well. So the great transition is the industrial revolution plus the demographic and epidemiological transitions. It's the largest transformation that human populations have encountered since the invention of agriculture. There have been changes in labor technology and economics. That's the industrial revolution. Changes in birth and death rates in age distributions, nutrition and growth. That's the demographic transition. And there have been changes in disease prevalence from infectious disease and malnutrition to cancer, chronic disease and degenerative disease. That's the epidemiological transition. Now, of course, we're watching this uh, slide in the middle of the COVID epidemic and it's an exception to the rule that we don't worry so much about infectious diseases anymore. They have resurfaced in a very serious way, but the general pattern is one in which there's been a decline in infectious disease over the last century. 
These three are combining to massively rearrange the human ecology of the planet. So just some images, here's a, a good example of the industrial revolution and the coal fired plants that are of course played a big role in global change as well. Here is a, a slide from the web showing the demographic transition and it's one in which first death rates fall and in stage two and then between stage two and stage three birth rates start falling and they fall continually into stage birth rates fall into stage four in the period in which the birth rates are above the death rates you get the population explosion which is what's happened on our planet over the last uh, two or three hundred years and then in stage five, the birth rates actually drop below the death rates and you get into naturally decreasing populations, which we now find in Western Europe, Japan, and in parts of the United States. The epidemiological transition is one in which there's been a shift from primarily infectious disease as a cause of mortality to non-communicative disease as a cause of mortality. There's a lot of different kinds of data for this. I've just chosen one slide to illustrate it. On the left, you can see the incidence of infectious diseases in, uh, expressed in a percent, uh, going from showing 1950 as being 100% and then dropping after that. On the right, you can see immune disorders increasing over that period. So as our exposure to pathogens has dropped as a result of hygiene, clean water, antibiotics, and vaccines. We have seen a great increase in autoimmune diseases, including multiple sclerosis, type 1 diabetes, asthma, Crohn's disease. And we've also seen quite an increase in cancer, cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, and dementia. These are big shifts in the causes of death. Here's a picture showing you how this has played out over uh, the last roughly uh, 250 to 300 years. And uh, take a, look, a minute to look first at the axes. We have life expectancy at birth on the x-axis, and then we have births per female per lifetime on the y-axis, that's expected family size or if you like, average reproductive success of a female expected at birth. And you can see that there's a cluster of countries up there that have different uh, dates on them. And down at the right, you can see France, Hungary, and Sweden. Now, the purple line shows population growth rate. And you can see that France, Hungary, and Sweden are all below the replacement rate of 1%, which is the blue-green line. You can also see that there's been really a rather remarkable change in life expectancy, both in uh, China and India and in countries of Western Europe between, uh, say, from between 300 and 100 years ago. So it was pretty normal for life expectancy at birth to be between, say, 30 and 40 years, up until about... Uh, say 1800 in Europe and uh, 1900 in other parts of the world. And now life expectancy is at 80 or over 80 in post-industrial countries. It's been a huge shift. Now, the consequence of that is that the driver of selection has been shifting from mortality to fertility. Here's some data that uh, it comes from England, and there's very good demographic data in the UK. This is from England, not from the UK. And on the x-axis, you see the year ranging from 1541 to 1991. On the y-axis, there's several different things plotted. The red line is the total fertility rate. Okay, that's births per female per lifetime. And you can see that it started to drop around 1830, and it's dropped way down in the, interim, in the interim. The mortality rate actually began to decline earlier. It began to decline about 1730. The total selection intensity is something that Jim Crow came up with. And basically it's the potential that, uh, where selection could act expressed as the total variation 
in uh, lifetime reproductive success. It has two components. One is the variation in mortality and the other is the variation in fertility that add up to give you the total variation in potential selection pressure. That's the black line. The amount of that potential accounted for by variation in mortality is the lower blue line. And the amount that's accounted for by variation in fertility is the lower pink line. They cross just about in England, just about in 1900. And what that means is that natural selection continues to act, but it's not acting so much through the different risks of mortality that people have. It's acting through the different family sizes that they are in. And there is still significant variation in family size, even in declining populations in post-industrial countries. So natural selection is correlated, and any trait that is correlated with variation in family size is going to be under natural selection for many, many different reasons. That is impacting ongoing human evolution. In the, now I'm talking about uh, results of large scale demographic studies here. And uh, I was involved in some of them. Others are from people in Australia. Virpi Buma has headed some of the ones in Finland. In the US, Australia and Finland, both men and women are experiencing selection for earlier age at first birth. This is in uh, post transition populations. In the US, for example, women are experiencing selection for greater age at last birth and at menopause, greater weight, shorter height, and lower levels of cholesterol, and lower levels of systolic blood pressure. So this is just to point out that we're still experiencing natural selection and it's operating on our life histories. It doesn't mean that we have responded yet to this because there hasn't really been enough time for very much genetic response to this change in selection. With Alex Cordio and others, uh, we also looked at uh, selection in the Gambia to try to expand our perspective and get something that was not a weird country, a Western industrial country. And there we found that selection across the demographic transition, which occurred in the 1970s, shifted from decreasing height and increasing body, uh, uh, body mass index to increasing height and decreasing body mass index. So it actually was doing something different in the Gambia than it was in Framingham, Massachusetts in the US. If you look, however, at the pattern that we saw in the post-industrial countries, where there is selection for earlier maturity, early, earlier menarche, but also selection for later menopause, it's broadening the window of opportunity for reproduction. That makes sense if the prime primary driver of natural selection has shifted from being mortality to being reproduction. This combination of earlier age at first birth and later age at last birth is broadening the reproductive window. So that's the biological potential for reproduction. But that is increasing the intensity of the conflict between biology and culture, where there are very good cultural reasons to start having children later in life and to have fewer of them. So if some of you are feeling pulled apart by this conflict between biology and culture, I regret to report that the direction of natural selection in contemporary populations is in fact intensifying it rather than reducing it. Uh, I think in most cases culture wins, but that doesn't mean that biology goes away. Okay, now back to the demographic issue. What's going on with this increasing lifespan? One of the take homes that I hope you'll have a week from now, if somebody asks you about this talk, is that our increased lifespan is exposing the costs of antagonistic pleiotropy. The longer post reproductive lifespans of post transition populations are exposing the effects of antagonistic pleiotropy that evolution had previously accumulated. We have good genetic analyses of cancer risk, coronary artery disease, and dementia. They suggest that advantages in fertility or in juvenile survival are linked to risks of disease in old age. The growing global burden of degenerative disease is thus explained in part by the exposure of previously evolved and previously hidden costs. We were on a buy now, pay later plan in the uh, Neolithic 
and up until the great transition. And now it's come time to pay those postponed costs. So in order to make this clear, I want to just use an example of a population. I've used a 2010 population from Angola to show what the populations of the developed countries might have looked like in the past. And I've used the population of Japan in 2010 to show what they now look like. So the idea is that reproductive traits that were formerly, formerly selected in our young ancestors in a population that had that sort of pyramid on the left are now linked to risks that are expressed in old people in populations that have the pyramid on the right. And if you just look at the areas of those bars, you can see that selection was strong on our young ancestors and that the risks were very low because there are very few people in this upper bar on the right over in the left-hand population. So it didn't cost much at that point to improve reproduction, but now we are paying the cost. What's the evidence for that? Well, consider breast cancer. BRCA1 and BRCA2 are famous uh, genes that increase the risk of breast cancer. And if a woman has a germline mutation for them, unfortunately, they, those are fairly rare, but they account for one to 13% of ovarian cancer and one to 5% of female breast cancer. Those mutations are associated with large increases in lifetime reproductive success, and they were probably selected in high fertility pre-transition populations. For cancer in general, there's a famous gene called P53. It's, uh, it's actually involved in cell cycle control and in DNA repair. Uh, if you get a mutation in it, then this gene that has a pivotal role in coordinating cellular, cellular response to DNA damage will be messed up. And such mutations result in a, uh, that, that if you have a mutation in the gene that is uh, a good one and results in better maintenance, it will give you longer lifespan and increased survival after a cancer diagnosis, okay? But the mutations that give you a shorter lifespan uh, are ones that uh, are the ones that, that cause cancer. Mutations in these genes are associated with a failure of the blastocyst to implant. So that's a cost of reproduction. If the blastocyst doesn't implant, the woman is infertile. And it is the variants that actually uh, are causing infertility that cause longer lifespan. The ones that promote fertility are the ones that increase cancer risk and cause a shorter lifespan. You can't have uh, a life history trait that occurs much earlier in life than implantation. And so this is a really dramatic example of the cost of reproduction in humans. Now, one of the ironies of improved public health and medicine is that first uh, they have saved us from infectious disease and then they have improved our survival for heart disease. They're currently improving our survival of cancer and that has saved us for Alzheimer's, you know. So uh, it's a rather ironic development that no matter what we appear to improve, something is always going to get us and some of those things that get us are getting pretty nasty. So here's an example of the ApoE4 allele. Uh, it's an interesting allele. Uh, it's something that humans have that isn't quite the same in chimpanzees. It's associated with a number of physiological functions, including probably uh, handling uh, the kinds of fats that you get in a high protein diet. So it may be associated with a shift towards hunting. The ApoE4 allele seems to protect cognitive development of poor, poorly nourished infants that are suffering from frequent diarrhea. Now that's one of the major causes of mortality worldwide. So there are good reasons why it might be selected to improve survival early in life, but it increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease and heart disease, atherosclerosis later in life. So it's a good example of antagonistic polyphrocytes. 
I was involved in a study that was really led by Sean Byers and Michael Anoye in Melbourne on coronary artery disease. Now, we know that from GWAS that there are more than 40 genes that increase the risk of coronary artery disease. All of these 40 genes show signals of recent selection, and they also increase reproductive success. So they are acting in an antagonistic pleiotropically way. They are improving reproductive success, but increasing the risk of coronary artery disease. The reason that we see a signal of selection is probably not because they've been uh, impacting heart disease, but because they have these other effects on reproductive success. So the take home on that is that having children could literally break your heart. Now, uh, there was a paper, I'll just put that up down here, that Sean and uh, Voskarides published in the Journal of Molecular Evolution earlier this year. These are the leading candidates for antagonistic pleiotropy in human disease. I won't dwell on the slide for a long time. You can go to the paper and study it if you want. But you'll notice that Huntington's disease, Alzheimer's, cancer, cystic fibrosis, and coronary artery disease all now are diseases where genetic effects that are important risk factors have been shown to have probable antagonistic pleiotropy effects. So to summarize the great transition, uh, it has led to improvements in food security and reductions in child mortality that result from big advances in public health and in medical care. They have been dramatically changing our demography, selection, health, and disease. They account for a significant part of the increases in obesities, in obesity, allergies, asthma, and autoimmune diseases. These are the diseases of mismatch. And our longer life is now revealing previously hidden costs of reproduction that are expressed as increased risk of cancer, dementia, and heart disease. So let's go back to the question. Could we evolve to live longer? Well, our lifespan is genetically variable and it could respond to selection just as the lifespan of fruit flies responded to selection. The response to strong selection would be rapid. It might even be faster than in flies. These are polygenic traits. They have a lifespan as a polygenic trait. There's standing genetic variation for it. This would involve small shifts in frequency of many genes and that could be rapid. Selection could be implemented, for example, by delaying age at first birth progressively. What I mean by that is that, oh, we can make a social compact where everyone said, I promise that I will not have my first child until I'm 30, and everyone would wait until they were 30, and then we would let evolution catch up with that, and it would improve the maintenance and physiology of everyone until they were 30, until 30 became the new 18. Then we would say, okay, now that we've gotten that far, we'll go until 40 and continue. All of the systems of the body would be improved in the survivors, okay? This is something that natural selection would do that it would be very hard for genetic engineering to do. They wouldn't only live longer, they'd be healthier, they'd be more vigorous at ages that we currently consider very old. The upper limit would be reached at several hundred years. That would be the expected lifespan if all intrinsic sources of mortality were eliminated and everyone eventually died in accidents or from violence rather than from aging or infectious disease. It's a fantasy. It's never going to happen. The selection regime couldn't be effective because many people would cheat and they would reproduce early. They would say, I think you, you can already see from all of the political divisions in our society of the different reactions to the pandemic and so forth, that there's a pretty significant so, uh, section of society that's just not going to agree to participate in something like that. So I don't think the Larrys should be investing as much money in this as they are. My own view of it is that uh, we probably will be able to improve lifespan a bit. Steve Austad has a bet that uh, we could improve it to 150. I don't know if we could go that far. Of course, we'd like to improve the health span and the happiness span as much as the lifespan. And I think that we can do that. What does it all mean? Well, the major assumptions and predictions of the evolutionary theory of aging are confirmed, and that includes in humans. Our bodies have evolved to be disposable. 
that gives us strong evidence that the focus of evolution is on the multiplication of genes, not on the survival of individuals. And from that point of view, which ignores culture, we, you and me, with our ideas and our hopes, our loves, our dreams, our art, our music, we're just supporting cast for the genes. We're not the leading players. However, we age because our reproduction has been improved. And perhaps if we recognize that a life is a whole, it's tied together from birth through maturity and old age to death, that can help us to accept the inevitability of our disappearance if we look at it as a whole. The aches and pains of age are balanced by the vigor, the beauty and the fecundity of youth. Death is balanced by birth. We can only fairly judge our lives by placing our youth and our age on the scale at the same time. The pain of aging is balanced by the joy of babies. Let me say a few words about joy. Here I am with three of my grandchildren. I have six of them. And you better believe that at the moment that that picture was taken, I was feeling extremely happy. Here's an eloquent comment on joy. It's not mine. We did not evolve to be happy. We evolved to be happy, sad, miserable, angry, anxious, and depressed. We evolved to love and to hate, to care and be callous. Our emotions are the carrots and the sticks that our genes use to persuade us to achieve their ends. But their ends need not be our ends. We are not lumbering robots. We're not puppets on strings. Goodness and happiness may be goals that are attainable only by hoodwinking our genes. We've gotten pretty good at hoodwinking our genes. And I'd like to thank David Haig for that wonderful quote in an author that he in an article he co-authored with me. Okay, I'm done, and I would be happy to have comments or questions. So Andreas. All right. Thanks very much, Steve. Yeah, we got we got loads of questions coming in. And so far, there hasn't been much upvoting going on. So I'm just going to go kind of more, more or less chronologically. Um, so the first question is, are there biological examples of no trade offs between reproduction and lifespan? Uh, yes, there are. As a matter of fact, people who do uh, even in fruit flies uh, or in Cenorhabditis or something like that, uh, People who are looking for the trade-offs learn that you don't see them unless you have uh, organisms that are somewhat nutritionally stressed. Uh, organisms are pretty well buffered, and uh, the trade-offs are often there. Uh, but unless you have your uh, populations maintained on a somewhat stressed diet, you won't necessarily see the trade-offs. I think the best evidence for the trade-offs is the uh, uh, correlated responses to selection. So, and yeah. that, that's been done in a number of different species, not just in flies. Mm -hmm. Cool. So the next question is, you mentioned surprises when applying gene therapy due to trade-offs. Do you think we can uncouple early life costs from longevity benefits by modifying gene function in an age-specific manner? And does data from model organisms suggest that this is a possibility and is in line with Williams' antagonistic pleiotropy theory? Question mark. Well, we might be able to. Um, I think the easiest way to get around the problem is to use whole organism somatic gene therapy, but there are real problems with the delivery vehicle. I think that there have been some early experiments done on mice where they tried to genetically transform adult mice, transforming every of the trillion cells in the body, and they showed both some success with that. And of course, if you make that intervention after reproduction, then you haven't incurred any reproductive costs. You simply fix the things that are going to uh, incur costs of reproduction. Germline therapy is a, a different case, and you're going to have to have incredibly precise interventions in order not to have unpleasant surprises. Because if you think that you can change something in the germline, it's going to be affecting every cell in the body as the organism develops. Mm -hmm. And uh, it implies that you think that you understand the entire genotype phenotype map. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> Uh, and I would hate for us to discover that we don't understand something by having people die or by discovering that uh, in order to try to make them live longer, we had rendered them sterile 
or done anything else to make it mess up reproduction. So yes, I suppose in principle, but in practice, I think that's a tough one. Right. Um, so there's a popular question. I was curious how organisms that show little to no senescence, uh, for example, Hydra, are the exception that proves the rule on the evolutionary inevitability of aging. Yeah, uh, I think that's a, a very interesting case. And there's some people at the Max Planck Institute uh, in uh, Rostock that have looked at that. Uh, the, what's going on, if you remember the E. coli picture with uh, the different uh, lifespans of the cells, Hydra has a system where there are stem cells that are scattered all over the body that step in and replace aging cells. So the stem cells are dividing all the time, just like the E. coli were dividing, and the stem cells would then have poles that were either old or young, and they're doing the replacement locally in an existing intact organism rather than as bacterial cells in the population. So I think that with appropriate uh, high-tech molecular methods, that process could probably be tracked within the body of a hydra, just as uh, Tadier's group in Paris tracked it in a population of bacteria. So mm. when I see evidence that there are things that don't age, I then want to know, well, what are the cellular dynamics? And are we really sure that the cell lines are not themselves aging? Or are we seeing something like that E. coli experiment? Mm. So the asymmetry is, a dif is at a different level where it yeah. doesn't affect the, yeah, oh, right. the asymmetry is still there, but it's just packaged inside mm -hmm. the organism. Uh, yeah. All right, so there's more questions coming through. Uh, you said that the germline does not have any special me mechanisms improving maintenance and repair, but we know it's better protected. Why do you think these mechanisms are reserved for the germline? Oh. Well, that gets us into a different aspect of evolutionary theory and Leo Buss's book, for example, which is about the protection of the germline. And uh, the germline is protected uh, from invasion by somatic cells. If a somatic cell defects from the multicellular covenant and decides to go off and try to get into the germline so that it doesn't have to die with the soma, uh, that will lead to selection for the germline being protected in a number of different ways. I wouldn't want, uh, I may have overstated my point. Natural selection is certainly doing a lot to renew the germline. That doesn't mean there would be no selection for improved maintenance in the germline. You might want to see some, but uh, certainly the ability of natural selection to eliminate defective cell lineages is going to be uh, an extremely powerful way of keeping the germline clean. And um, that doesn't rule out possible biochemical and cellular maintenance mechanisms. Mm -hmm. All right, um, under antagonistic theory, we should expect many large adverse genetic effects late in life. Why do you think we have found so few so far? large adverse genetic effects late in life? Uh, well, uh, it depends on uh, what species you're talking about. If you're looking at Drosophila, there are uh, huge impacts of antagonistic pleiotropy on mortality rates. And uh, the reason that we don't have genes identified for all of them uh, is that we don't have the kind of GWAS and uh, pathology in Drosophila that we have in humans. In humans, we have a lot of GWAS and we have good pathological investigations. So we can look at causes much better in humans. I think that one of the reasons is that we have only recently become aware of this. And I think that the number of examples of antagonistic pleiotropy in humans is simply going to increase. But if you ask yourself, what kind of data do you need in order to do so? Well, essentially you need Scandinavia. You need people that have been followed from birth to death where every medical problem has been looked at and you need whole genome sequencing for them. So right at that point, you're down to the country of Iceland, which is rather protective of its genetic resources. Mm. If you could scale that up to the whole planet, I think that there would be a field day and uh, a lot of uh, people who love computers and statistics would run amok. Uh, 
And I think that we would rapidly find lots of evidence for antagonistic pleiotropy and genetic bases for costs of reproduction in humans. Hmm. Big project that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. But there'll, there'll be a lot to be learned from the small partial projects that will sure. come. Sure. Um, so there's another question. Most of the examples you presented are derived from studies of life history trade-offs within species. What do you think are, uh, sorry, what do you think are the most interesting outstanding questions about the evolution of life history that may be answered by looking across species in a comparative framework? Well, people are loving the comparative framework and uh, they're doing a lot of it because uh, it doesn't force them to do experiments. <laughs> And uh, it's driven both by the, the great and wonderful insights of molecular phylogenetics and by advances in the comparative method. So there are certainly many interesting uh, patterns that you can learn from examining life history comparisons. Paul Harvey and Andrew Reed and uh, 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 Dan Promislow and others did a lot of that kind of thing in the late 1980s and early 1990s. And uh, there are some really wonderful questions that uh, were posed. For example, uh, why do bats live longer than similarly sized mammals uh, that don't fly? Uh, why is it that uh, a bat is able to have the highest reproductive investment of any mammal but still fly? <laughs> They're carrying something like, it's almost like a kiwi. There's a bat that can fly around with twins. So it turned up lots of very interesting questions, but it hasn't led to experimental programs that then start to look at the developmental, physiological, genetic mechanisms that are involved in that. That has more been taken up by uh, Thomas Flatt and the people that are looking at what are the mechanistic bases of life history variation. I think that there are lots of interesting uh, comparative patterns in life history, but my own philosophical bent is that uh, in the end, if you want to understand causes, you're going to have to do some experiments. And that means that there may be some phenomena that are just out of range of that and remain things where you're just looking at patterns. So uh, I think that there are wonderful things to learn from comparative biology. I think the question of why don't elephants get cancer is a great question. And I think that comparative biology is a prime source of, of great questions. The problem is it's not a prime source of great answers. <laughs> yeah, well, nailing the causation, I guess, is... It, yeah, you if you really want, if you want yeah. to nail the causation, you, you have to approach it some other way. That doesn't mean we won't learn from it. After all, look at astronomy and geology. They don't do experiments in astronomy and geology, and those are good sciences, and they're hard sciences, and we've learned a lot from them. So I don't want to be too hard on comparative biology. If they can have the kind of success that astronomy has had, great. It takes a hell of a lot of precision to compensate for the lack of experiments. Mm -hmm. Right, we have time for one last question. And uh, apologies to, to all the questions that didn't get us answered. Um, Steve said he, he would probably look through them and maybe take them off at a later um, stage. Right, so there's one final question. Something that I think is, mo is both a cultural push that is framed as a health biological fact is that it's dangerous for women to have children after 35 uh, and any pregnancies after that are considered geriatric. What are your thoughts on that discourse and a possibly more accurate age for health healthy pregnancies in modern America? Well, I know from personal experience that as a woman approaches 40, the probability of a genetic defect or of a otherwise complicated pregnancy goes up pretty strongly. Um, I think that uh, anyone who is considering this issue should look carefully at recent data. I wouldn't want to, you know, now I'm being asked to make a comment that might affect an extremely important decision in someone's life. I want to be very careful about that. Uh, I do not know of any evidence that the quality control filters that are in the female reproductive tract are aging any less rapidly than they had been in the past, or that the frequency of chromosomal defects in women who are aged, say, 38 to 45 or something like that has dropped significantly. 
I, I think that all of those patterns are still in place. And all I can do is suggest that anyone who is dealing with these issues consult a well-informed human geneticist. Uh, they are available in the genetic clinics of most major hospitals. All right, thank you very much. That's, uh, that's our, our time limit. Thanks to, to sticking to your time limit with, with your talk. Uh, with that, we're wrapping up here. Our next talk is on the coming Monday. Uh, Alexander Zhu will be talking about the evolution of genomic oddities, making sense of transposons, satellites, and germline soma genome difference, differences in birds. We hope you can join us again uh, on Mondays. Um, you can stay up to date about upcoming talks by joining our Slack channel and following um, Eco Evo Seminars on, on Twitter. Thanks for watching and have a great weekend. Goodbye.